stop sharing. So hi everyone, um, my name is Maggie Fleming um, and I am the GrowSmart Maine Board Secretary and Events Committee Chair. Um, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar at the Gorham Spur, Spurring Growth Without Spurring Sprawl. And I'll be moderating today's webinar alongside our, uh, my fellow Events Committee member, Margus Miller. And um, we have seven distinguished panelists with us today. Christina Egan, who is the Executive Director of the Greater Portland Council of Governments. Jay Trace, who is the Planning Director for the Town of Scarborough. Paul Godfrey, who's the Vice President and Northern New England Office Leader for HNTV. Scott Hastings, who's the Town Planner for the Town of Standish. Peter Mills, who's the Executive Director for the Maine Turnpike Authority. Beth Osborne, who's the Director of Transportation for America, which is a Smart Growth America program. And then also we have Tom Foyer, who's the Director of Community Development for the Town of Gorham. And for time efficiency, I'm not going to introduce each panelist, but their bios and photos are available on the GrowSmart Wayne website. And um, we've put the link in the chat to those if you'd like to review them. And we're pleased to have a broad group of attendees with us today, including representatives of the impacted communities, our partner nonprofits, including Greater Portland Landmarks, Portland Downtown, Genesis Community Fund, and the Bicycle Coalition of Maine, as well as representatives from the Portland Press Herald. And as, um, we, I also have some fellow board members from GrowSmart Maine attending. Um, and I would like to take a moment to honor the people of the Wabanaki Confederacy, the Penobscot, Cosmoquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq peoples. These people are the traditional inhabitants of the lands of the state of Maine. And no matter where you're watching from today in Maine, you're on traditional Wabanaki territory. And in thinking about your personal relationship with Maine and future opportunities for the state during today's webinar, please consider the relationship that members of the Wabanaki Confederacy have shared and continue to share with this place as well. The mission of GrowSmart Maine is to build lasting prosperity without sacrificing the quality of life that defines Maine. We work towards this goal by raising awareness of smart growth principles, sharing resources, advocating and convening stakeholders through programming and events like this webinar. So why are we here today? We've been hearing a lot of different opinions about plans for a spur road connecting Gorham and the main turnpike. GrowSmart Maine has not taken a position on the potential spur, but we decided to host this webinar as an opportunity to convene stakeholders and to share knowledge. And themes you will hear from our panelists today or that the proposed spur is only one part of a solution for the congestion and issues impacting the east-west corridor communities. And additionally, we can't discuss transit without discussing housing development. GrowSmart Maine was one of over 150 organizations and individuals to submit written testimony in support of LD 2003, an act to implement the recommendations of the commission to increase housing opportunities in Maine by setting zoning and land use restrictions as well as offer suggestions to magnify the bill's impact. We're considering future webinars on this bill and additional bills related to affordable housing after the conclusion of the legislative session. So um, finally, I'll talk us through today's agenda. This will be a 90 minute webinar. The first, first portion of the webinar that I'll be moderating will provide background information and will address the status of state, regional and municipal planning efforts related to the spur and um, the congestion and transit issues in the region. Um, in the second portion of the webinar that Marcus will be moderating, we'll talk about why this topic's been so contentious, um, and then as well as next steps. And then we'll leave time at the end for questions and answers. We encourage you to use the chat function to share your thoughts throughout the webinar, and then to use the Q&A function for specific questions you'd like the panelists to answer today. And the webinar will be recorded today and will be posted to our YouTube and social media channels. So now um, I'd like to have Paul Godfrey join me for the first portion of our session um, about where we are now. Thanks, Maggie. How are you? Good. How are you? Um, so if you want to start with providing a little bit of background information about how we got to where we are, um, the 2012 feasibility study, what are some of the goals of this work that's been done and some of the issues that have come up in these communities related to congestion and traffic? Sounds good and happy to do that, Maggie. So I'm um, going to talk a lot about uh, the 2012 study and in, 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 in my time here. Uh, but really, this starts before 2012. Back in 2007, um, as the Gorham Bypass was in the process of being completed, uh, four communities, uh, the town of Gorham, uh, town of Scarborough, 
uh, cities of Westbrook and South Portland uh, signed a memorandum of agreement uh, asking the, the Turnpike Authority and DOT to continue to uh, address the growing congestion, safety, and mobility challenges uh, that they were facing in their region. Also in 2007, uh, in a precursor to the 2012 study, the Maine State Legislature directed uh, the Turnpike Authority and DOT um, to study congestion and mobility uh, west of, of, of Portland. Uh, their directive also included uh, a request to study the same uh, in the southern region down near Sanford, but obviously for today's purposes, we're focused on uh, the study around uh, uh, in the area west of Portland. So let's talk a little bit about the 2012 study. Uh, it began in 2009. Um, really, the study's charge was to um, first and foremost document uh, what the uh, what the perceived uh, uh, transportation and land use deficiencies were, um, and then understand through due course process uh, what was the right way to address that. So, um, as we started the 2012 study, we we looked to document what those transportation deficiencies were, and what we found uh, in 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 2009 to 2012 was that in fact uh, increasing and growing congestion was very much uh, significantly impacting mobility uh, along key transportation corridors in the region. So much so that local roads, neighborhood roads, roads that really weren't designed to accommodate large volumes in traffic were in fact doing that. They were, they were accommodating cut through traffic. People were having a lot of traffic in their front yards. It was becoming a growing problem that was identified and documented. We also saw during this time that the number of uh, crashes was increasing in the region, and most notably what the state calls high crash locations were also increasing, uh, not, not only in the number of locations, but in the frequency in which crashes were occurring. We saw that roadways that had been designed decades ago did not meet current uh, design and safety guidelines, uh, and also very importantly, we saw that these facilities did not have pro uh, proper accommodations for pedestrians, bicycles, and also for alternate modes of transportation. On the land use side, Maggie, what we saw was that uh, because of these congestion and mobility issues, it was really threatening the community's uh, quality of life. Neighbors were complaining, residents were complaining, we don't like this increased volume of traffic, we don't like seeing uh, traffic on our residential roads, quality of life was very much a, um, a, a, an issue to be addressed. Um, we knew a lot of communities were trying really hard to create compact, walkable, bikeable, transit supportive communities. And again, given the challenges of, of, of a lot of through traffic in the region, uh, there, was, there was a challenge in being able to address that. Um, communities also wanted to, and, and places like GP Cog and PACS, wanted to support all transportation modes, try to create hubs, and again, create policies around that. We also saw as part of this, and again, this is sort of the outcome of uh, what's been occurring and why the problem is that we're trying to address is that a lot of unplanned loss of open space. Um, the communities west of Portland are some of the fastest growing communities in the state. Uh, affordable housing is there. So people were going to the west, uh, building their homes, a lot of loss of open space, uh, fragmented habitat, uh, loss of rural space. So again, challenges there. Um, and we also saw, uh, again, not because there weren't great minds trying to do great things, but um, you know, communities uh, zoning and planning didn't necessarily line up across town boundaries. So uh, a lot of land use deficiencies that, that were seen and, and, and documented as part of the process. So we did a lot of analysis. We did a lot of documentation, data collection. Ultimately, Maggie, the three recommendations that came from the 2012 study were, and again, they weren't singular, we, we, we acknowledged and identified that these three really needed to happen, happen in tandem. Um, the first was that the municipalities uh, really should continue to work to improve land use opportunities by creating pockets of housing, commercial density, again, density that would support uh, transit, uh, less open space uh, development, and again, really look to try to uh, develop in a more mindful way. The study also documented the great opportunity to expand and enhance transit, uh, again, with a mind to provide transportation choice, but even with strong land use and, and strong enhanced and expanded transit, the study also documented the need to add capacity, which at that time was identified as either widening existing mm -hmm. roads or building new roads. So, that was really the conclusion of the 2012 study. Uh, study <coughs> findings were endorsed by the four municipalities, Maine DOT, Turnpike Authority, uh, as well as GP COG and PACS. 
Great, thank you. That's really good context. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how we got from the 2012 study to the current discussions around the spur? Who's really leading that effort? It's kind of, it definitely seems like it's MTA, but I know that there's more going on there. Absolutely, Maggie. So really, why, why myself, why the Turnpike Authority is here today? It's simply because the four towns that I've mentioned, Gorham, Scarborough, Westbrook, South Portland, uh, they, along with Maine DOT, and along again with the Maine State Legislature, have asked uh, the Turnpike Authority to step forward uh, and look at uh, advancing the opportunity to build uh, a new Gorham connector. Um, in 2017, the four municipalities uh, signed an updated MOA or an MOA that reaffirmed their position. The legislature also in 2017 directed the Turnpike Authority uh, to look forward to advancing a Gorham connector. And as recently as this year, 2022, those same four towns, Maine DOT have come forward and said, please, we're looking for you to advance this. We're looking to address the, the challenges. And in fact, Maggie, that's what the Turnpike Authority has been doing for the last two years is working towards um, developing an alternatives analysis, which will be used towards um, documenting the need uh, and ultimately the, 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 the determination that the right solution towards addressing congestion and mobility is a connector, uh, but we also recognize, and again, obviously why we're here today is we recognize that it can't just be a connector. It has to be a connector in conjunction with opportunities for improved land use, opportunities for expanded and enhanced transit. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, what a great opportunity to include housing as part of the overall, uh, overall discussion. So really bottom line, um, this is not a turnpike led initiative. Uh, this is a request from communities and DOT and the legislature for the Turnpike Authority to lead this effort. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, do you have anything additional you want to add? And we can also bring in um, Peter and Christina for this, the next part of the conversation as well. I think I will just wrap and then turn it over to them by saying again, you know, one of the one of the opportunities that uh, the by the Turnpike Authority leading this that we see and We've heard a lot of comments about this, obviously, over the past few months, you know, concern, legitimate concerns from folks saying, well, you know, if you build this, who's going to maintain it? You know, is this going to is this going to induce, you know, induce demand, induce development? Uh, these are all legitimate concerns. One of the great opportunities by having the Turnpike Authority lead this effort is um, as a toll facility, which is what this is being proposed as, uh, the, the opportunity for it to be maintained uh, is, is, is sustained because tolls would be collected and it would be able to uh, maintain and operate the roadway. Um, and we are aware, and it's actually part of the effort that the Turnpike Authority is, is moving forward with is, we know it's necessary to understand if this road is built, what might induced development, induced demand look like, and what is that level, and how can we help the communities and the region best plan for it? So again, um, you know, the authority has taken a very strong mindset to not looking at this just as a road, but as part of a um, multifaceted solution for the region, again, to address the problems that we've talked about earlier. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I'd ha love to have Peter and Christina join us for the next portion of the conversation. Watch court now. Paul and I are swapping machines was, was easier <laughs> than. So Peter, I don't know if you want to add anything to what Paul said about um, why this spur is sort of the alternative that we're going forward with now and what um, MTA's position is on the spur. I can't add much to it except to emphasize that we're, we're involved only by invitation. I mean, the Turnpike is not a, an agency that is a, necessarily an advocate agency for highways. We build what we're asked to build or we're directed to build and what we're authorized to build. And in 2017, the legislature with testimony from many different sources uh, overwhelmingly endorsed the idea of building the spur. So we started really at that point, we weren't prepared to build it until we had completed, designed and built and completed uh, a lot of work west of Portland on widening the road as it then existed going around Portland and also refurbishing 
exit 45, which was ancient and, and was desperately in need of upgrading, that work is essentially done. It will be done by the, the exit 45 overhaul will be done by the end of this year. So it is the region where this new alignment, new road would terminate is prepared to accept that traffic at this juncture. And it, it is, it is uh, uh, fair to say that it can be built or it may not be built. I mean, we're prepared either way. That is, we've done all the improvements on the west side of Portland because we needed to do them independently of whether there is a Gorham spur or Gorham connector that comes into it. But if a Gorham connector is built and comes into it, that system will be fully prepared to accept that additional traffic. Um, we are in the process, we've done a lot of work defining a potential alignment uh, going out looking at the environmental issues, the historical property <laughs> issues. I've been to about 100 houses and businesses where that could possibly be affected uh, by a, a proposed alignment. I've met all of these folks and uh, we've, we've actually acquired some of the real estate in, in those cases where somebody had property that they wanted to sell and they were anxious to, 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 do, to have it sold. And if they were right on what we suspect would be the logical alignment, then we have stepped in and accommodated them by buying, in, in rare instances, in several instances, we have bought property. Um, but we're, we're looking now at, at sometime this summer, now that we have an alignment that people can actually look at and understand where it starts and where it ends and where it goes, we need to review that alignment again with the regulatory agencies, to the DEP and the Army Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife people and, and other people that would be interested in reviewing all of that, make sure that we have their concerns at least looked at and addressed, and then go ahead and, and engage, commence a public engagement process where we will invite various constituencies to comment on it, to step forward, tell us what they think of it, and, and recommend changes uh, that might, might be in order. So that process hasn't, we've begun it in an odd way. We've met with some portions of that constituency. For instance, we have gone to all of the four towns to their councils. We've been to ITAC, we've been to, we were up in <laughs> Buxton last night. <laughs> so we, we have gotten around to some extent to, to talk to various uh, folks that are interested in understanding what the road would do and where it would go. We also, I, I want to end this by re-emphasizing something that Paul said, and that is the, the findings of the 2012 study are that this needs to be a three-legged stool, for lack of a, it's an awful expression, but the building a separate road in order to get the traffic off Route 22, which is County Road or Outer Congress Street, to get it off Running Hill Road, to remove traffic from Route 114, from Brackett Road, from Saco Street, from all of those roads that are now jammed with traffic. When I went through high school in Gorham, those were, some of those were dirt roads. Uh, today they are paved and they are jammed with traffic at eight o'clock in the morning and again at 4.30 in the evening. So if to do that, it opens up the possibility of bringing more, bringing transit into this region. It brings, opens up the possibility of having multifamily housing in regions that are not built on yet. There's a lot of open land. It's remarkably close to Portland and Westbrook and South Portland, but there's a lot of open land. There's tremendous financial pressure on developing that land and the towns, Gorham in particular, is very anxious to make sure that it's done, that whatever development occurs is done properly, done intelligently. And in fact, they've gone ahead and already amended their comprehensive plan to say that this lot of this land right now is zoned for single family homes with 60,000 square feet of minimum lot size. The comprehensive plan that they have provisionally adopted says that if there is a transportation solution, a mobility solution for this region, that will no longer be the case, that only multifamily housing will be permitted on these rather large tracts of land that are still open. Uh, I happen to think that 
that's the proper policy, I, I, given what the demands are. I mean, I, we've all been witness to what's being built. I don't want to drag on here, but we've all been witness to all of the multifamily. Nobody can afford to buy a single family home anymore. I don't know what happened, but that, that dream of coming home from World War II in the 50s, you know, and building and getting your own single family home, I, it's not affordable anymore. I don't know what happened. So multifamily housing is being built everywhere we look at Rock Row, at the Beacon in Scarborough, Scarborough Downs, Latitude behind the main mall is 256 units that just went up. Um, Saco Island, the Hiawatha on Congress Street. I mean, it's J.B. Brown. All of these, they're scary huge. Um, and that's where the, and a lot of the money's coming in from out of state, by the way. Apparently it's profitable. And the land that lies, the open land that lies out west of Portland is highly vulnerable to those forms of development. But it has to be done under the my view is it needs to be done with intelligent management from the planning directors, of, particularly of Gorham and Scarborough. And we have one from Scarborough here today. So this, it's all got to work together. It, it's not, it's not a, an issue that can be addressed with one solution in isolation from the others. Thank you. Sorry to drone on. No, thank you. Those are all great points. Um, Christina, I know that GP Cog hasn't taken a position on the spur and isn't planning to take a position on the spur. Um, but can you talk a little bit to what you see as the intersections between this project and the state climate action plan as well as the transit planning process? Yeah, sure. Maggie, thanks so much for having the Greater Portland Council of Governments here today. Uh, we care deeply about the future of the region. And we do not have a funding role in the spur and we have no regulatory authority over it. So our role is really for us to understand how this proposed road will interact with public transportation. And we're the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the region, which means that we program transit funds and plan the long range uh, transit investments for the region. So as Peter said, that's one of the three legs of the stool. And for us to really work very uh, closely with the turnpike as we're thinking about the future transit investments and actually the current ones too. And then our other role as a regional planning agency is looking at the land use. And of course, municipalities have um, exclusive and local control over their land uses, but GP COG plays a role of working with municipalities to help them understand how they can zone and plan in a way that creates village style development where homes and jobs are close together. They're served by public transportation and less um, uh, intensive modes of transportation. So on this project in particular, we are playing a convening role. In fact, earlier this week at our uh, PACS table, which is the, uh, the federal transportation agency that we, we oversee, um, we had multiple perspectives that were uh, expressed at that meeting. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're airing all of those things. We understand the needs of the communities. We have uh, the four member communities, um, Scarborough, South Portland, Westbrook, and Gorham are all members of GP COG. We know about the traffic issues. And we wanna also understand the concerns um, that a project like this spurs, oh, sorry for the pun, uh, mm -hmm. what kind of concerns there are. And um, as we're exploring what the impacts and the benefits of the project are, we wanna make sure that we're trying to help the Turnpike make this project the best that it possibly can be, and maybe even help define some of the mitigation that could help us in the region in the long term. So you asked specifically about transit and the climate action plan. And I'd first say that right now, um, in 2012, the Husky line had not yet been introduced. So that's a new thing. And then also the Greater Portland Council of Governments is leading a new study to look at rapid transit, which is high capacity, fast transit that moves a lot of people. It'd be one of the first ones in the, in the region. And we're excited about the potential to actually catalyze village style development along that route. It's not the same corridor um, as the spur. So there's some questions that need to be answered about how that transit project is going to impact the turnpike and vice versa. So will the transit riders um, actually be reduced if people are driving. And similarly, would toll riders be reduced with the transit or are the projects complementary in the sense that transit could help preserve the long-term capacity of the road? We don't know the answers to any of those questions yet. So that's one of the things that we wanna look at. In terms of land use and sprawl, um, congestion is a natural 
constraint on housing growth. Peter's right, we've seen a tremendous amount of housing growth in the Western areas um, from Portland. There's been a mostly single family, although Gorham and Westbrook and others, Scarborough Downs, Rock Row, all of these are really good examples of municipalities working to create more multifamily housing, closer in, walkable. And we would hope that the transit system would serve that and in some way figure out how the spur could also, spur to, could also help um, support that village style. The last thing I would say is that PAX and GBCOG really look at projects in the future using both a climate lens and also a social equity lens. And as we're making investments in the region, whether they be transportation, broadband, housing, uh, et cetera, we need to understand what the implications are there. The Maine Won't Wait state climate plan sets a goal of reducing the amount that people drive by 10%. It also sets a goal of reducing emissions. And so that's another question to be answered is how does the spur and also the rapid transit project that we're looking at, how do those interact with those goals. Um, and from an equity perspective, how do we serve the people in our region that have lower incomes. It's very expensive to own a car and so that's one of the main roles of public transportation. How does public transportation try to expand mobility options for people that have been historically underinvested in or disenfranchised from kind of job opportunities and educational opportunities. So those are again I'm, I'm raising a lot of questions and not giving you answers, but we don't have the data yet on those three pieces of how it interacts with transit what the impacts are on sprawl and development. And then lastly, how do we understand it in terms of climate benefits and disbenefits and equity benefits and disbenefits? Great, thank you, Christina. Um, and just a reminder to the audience, we are gonna be holding questions until the end. Um, we'll do a Q&A session with all of our panelists at the end, but feel free to pop any questions into the Q&A um, box if you want us to answer them later. Um, and I think I'd like to go ahead and bring on um, our municipal representatives, Scott Hastings, Tom Poirier, and Jay Chase. Okay, um, so if you want to start, if you all want to take turns kind of talking about some of the congestion issues you're seeing in your communities and other problems that um, you think could be addressed through the spur and some of the other solutions that we've talked about already today. Okay, I, I guess I, I'll, I'll go first since. Thanks, Tom. Um, so we see tremendous uh, both morning and night uh, uh, going eastbound and then westbound at night, um, which would spurred the whole concern regarding traffic congestion, which started the whole east-west corridor study in 2012. So I was, I've been part of the study in the town since 2012. And it was clear early on in that study, DOT made it obvious as well as main turnpike that it trapped, relieving traffic congestion with new capacity on roads was not gonna be the only solution. We needed to do more to ensure that the capacity of that road network that they were gonna build into it lasted as long as possible. So land use had to be a portion of it as well as transit. So that first study in 2012 did a good job of really educating, I think, elected and appointed officials about the importance of getting density right to support transit along the, those corridors, both 25 and 114 and 22. Um, and then we moved on from that study in uh, the four communities, uh, as well as Portland. And I, I can't remember, Scott, if Standish was involved in that next round of studies. We did. A, we did a land use study called the PAX Transit Supportive Development Study in 2015. Each of the four communities, as well as Portland, I thought Standish got to pick a portion of town to do kind of a growth analysis. Uh, Gorham and Scarborough, we went in together and we studied South Gorham and North Scarborough because of that area is the, the neighborhood and the village that gets most impacted from the traffic. They see it every day and we, and so I think you asked the question, they said, why the spur? As part of that land use study, we went to them, it says, a couple of the recommendations is a spur or making this road four lanes wide with a turn lane. Is that something you want in your neighborhood? It took us three meetings just to get off them complaining about traffic to actually start about land use. And once they started to talk about land use, it was evident that they liked the village style that they had and they want to continue that. So 
that came out of that tr PACS transit study. There was a bunch of recommendations with that. Forward on to 2016, the town did the comp plan and that idea of mixed use development and, and industrial growth was was brought forward in that and we have a bunch of mixed use corridors along those to support transit and then in 2018 uh partnering with uh, metro as well as husky we joined the husky line we've got to stop in the downtown to start that transit and then hopefully as we get our growth areas up and running to a density we can add add more transit stops along those corridors and i'll stop there turn it over to jay or scott okay. Great. Thanks, Tom. Jay Chase, uh, Planning Director here in Scarborough. So not to try to repeat too much of what's already been said, because I think a lot of it's already been touched on, but here in Scarborough, we, you know, our community, we have a village called North Scarborough that sort of lives at the overlap of 22 and 114 in Saco Street. And that's really a lot of what Tom was just talking about with the with the residents really feeling as though the village is no longer a village. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, the quality of life um, for, has been diminished from the congestion. And, you know, as Tom said at those meetings back in 2012 or, or whatever the time frame was, really we heard from the neighbors for, who had lived there for many years sort of saying, Boy, here we are talking about this this east west connector. We've been talking about this for thirty years. Is this <laughs> when's this thing ever going to happen? So, I think you know from that perspective, I think there's you know real interest here in Scarborough to try to maintain that village that's recognized in our comprehensive plan um, and in the land use zoning that we have in place. Um, but we really haven't been able to start to see that articulated yet due to the the, the existing congestion issues. I think another thing that was touched on, I think it might've been early on, what we've seen coming out of one, you know, uh, 114 and 22 is congestion on, on, the, on the rural roads. And really this, by and large in Scarborough, we see the west side of the turnpike as being more of the rural suburban nature of our community. We're really trying to direct the most of growth sort of between the 95 and Route 1 corridor, um, with one of the exceptions sort of being the village center I referenced in, in North Scarborough. And so I think, you know, we're starting to see a lot of the congestion spill out onto those more rural roads that really aren't designed to handle that type of traffic. Um, it's interesting to hear Peter sort of talking about the the amount of multifamily development that's occurring and reference to a number of projects here in Scarborough from Scarborough Downs to the Beacon. And those really are in those areas between 95 and Route 1, where we're really trying to direct the growth and enable um, the, the uh, development of new housing choices. Scarborough did a really nice job of doing single family homes in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and there weren't a whole lot of multifamilies being developed. And so we're really starting to see some of that come online. And, and as we're now starting to see that density come into place, we're able to have those uh, more robust and fuller conversations around transit. We actually just completed a, a transit study with our, uh, our colleagues at, at uh, GP COG um, and the developers with the Downs to start to see about, okay, as we're starting to see this type of growth in our community, what is the ridership uh, potential? So it is really a foundational study. We have a lot more work to do, um, but you know that's as was talked about and transit's a big piece of what we're trying to figure out here uh, as well, so. That's what I have for now. Thanks, Jay. Um, Scott, do you want to add anything about the different issues yeah. you've been seeing in your community? Right. Yeah, so I'm Scott Hastings. I'm the town planner in Standish. And this has sort of been alluded to. We're on the, the edge of this project. And I don't think anyone sees this reducing the congestion within town because it's sort of out at the end. And we've been watching it from the beginning more on the risk of what it could make worse. But the town has been much more encouraged by the big picture approach that this is involved with the land use with the transit and at time and usually with including us out here and the impacts that are going to happen upstream which has been our concern from the beginning of some of the intersections of uh, 25 and 35 and 114 and 35 that are already 
underdesigned for the level of traffic that they are have going through them. And also what that amount of traffic as it increases might have on the areas that we are even before the study trying to create that village land use, uh, particularly in the Standish Corner area, where we've had some pretty, uh, I'd say good, good zoning in terms of de developing that type of village with some density. And in the years since we are, spur or not, we are seeing that development pressure as, as has been alluded to from the market forces coming to town. And we have a large number of units, including some of these uh, more townhouse, more dense developments that you wouldn't expect out this far going in. So that's gonna mean a need for the ability to handle this kind of traffic. And ideally, hopefully with transit, even out to, to Standish to where they can support these developments and help reduce traffic in that way. So that's been the, the main interest we have and, and what we're, we're hoping to see go forward is more thought about how this fits into the greater context, both in traffic flow, but in that, that land use and transit and sort of see, I think we've seen in the region with uh, the bus line going out 302, that transit can work in Maine, which is something that I was certainly told wasn't true for a long time. So I think we can, I'm glad that we are including that in this discussion. And I think we need to continue to heavily. Thank you, Scott. Um, I know you all just sort of touched on it in your comments about what you're seeing in your communities. Do you have anything further to add about um, land use planning or anything coming up that you're planning that you haven't done yet? Or, And I know when we had our call um, to talk about this, um, we did recognize that transit wasn't included as a panelist today. So um, that's a definitely a big piece of this. Uh, the only thing uh, I'll, I'll touch on quickly is uh, the town of Gorham has a development transfer overlay district. So we allow developers to buy up density in our growth districts. And we utilize those funds to purchase land in the rural district. So we have probably a pretty active one. And we just went out to start the process to look at possibly buying land with the funds we have collected. So um, that's a program we're hoping to further as we develop these growth districts. Thanks, Tom. Jay or Scott, anything further to add? Uh, I guess I would just offer, you know, we've recently adopted a new comprehensive plan here in the community, which largely builds off the foundation of our prior comp plan. And, you know, as I was referencing before, we're here in our community really starting to see the articulation of a lot of the rezoning we had done in the last decade. And we're starting to see that de development and growth be directed in those areas that we want to. So I think we're, we're carefully sort of monitoring that. And, um, and certainly, um, I think one of the pieces we need to understand is where exactly the, the how many and where the interchanges will be off the, you know, I, I understand they're going to be few. Um, but where exactly those are going to be and what what role those might play in in traffic mitigation or or or, or traffic flows in general, I guess I should say. <clears throat> Thanks. Um Scott, any um, additional comments? Well, very similar to to what's been said. We're maybe a few steps behind Scarborough and that we are looking forward to a a near future compliment update, but certainly in looking at, the village zoning that I mentioned earlier and making sure that it's ready for this pressure that's coming so that it can be used efficiently to, to get what we want to see. Great, thank you all. Um, and I think now I'd like to turn it over to Marcos and um, Beth, and then I think um, we'll have the other panelists chime in, chime in as appropriate um, for this section of the program. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, I'm Marcos Miller. I'm a member of the events committee and I'm with Beth Osborne, who's the director of Transportation for America. Thanks for joining us, Beth. Good to be here. Um, I just wanted to highlight, set, sort of set our context for our conversation on something that all the panelists has al already mentioned and I think is really a critical piece of the study. And that is the, um, the importance of the integration of the land use planning, the transit planning, as well as the, the road building. Um, and just to read a little quote from the study itself, it says, 
transportation, that is road and transit solutions alone would not be sufficient to manage traffic congestion that would occur in the region. It goes on to say that municipalities must adopt future land use patterns that support a more efficient way for residents to travel to jobs and services. And it warns that only in this way can the public investment in existing and new transportation infrastructure be protected. And it seems like that's, you know, what we've heard from the panelists, Beth, are really online with that. Um, what, what risks do you see in this plan potentially? Well, there are two different categories of risks and you've kind of uh, hinted at them. There are the transportation risks and there are the development risks. In transportation, on all projects, we risk that travel patterns will change, for example. Um, I mean, COVID definitely showed us that we can get thrown a curveball, and we don't quite know what things are going to be like as we uh, fully exit uh, the pandemic. Um, and, you know, if travel patterns change, maybe this project doesn't address the needs that follow. And when travel patterns have changed in other parts of the country, we have found uh, large investments go underused while other areas underinvested in. We run the risk that the road just fills up again, and that further pushes people right back onto the local roads. And congestion can increase even if population grows very slowly, or even when it shrinks. We have seen sizable, rather shocking increases in congestion in places that are losing population, like Buffalo, my hometown of New Orleans and Detroit, basically because of people spreading out and, uh, and land use. Uh, we run the risk of people staying on local roads despite uh, this project. Maybe people stay on local roads just to avoid tolls. Uh, we run the risk of transit options not being realized, underfunded, or not terribly functional uh, because we've alleviated uh, traffic or we've encouraged such additional sprawl that transit doesn't really work for folks. Within development risks, we uh, run the risk that this project just encourages development further out uh, because now we've made longer trips faster and at least in the short run, they look shorter. And then we add more uh, and additional and longer trips in the region on those very roads. Um, there's further loss of farmland and natural land. Uh, and there's more infrastructure and services needed to be paid for by the taxpayer with fewer people spread out due to low density. Uh, that results, uh, if you look at the patterns across the country, in either taxes going up or infrastructure and services deteriorating. It's usually the latter, and it tends to happen in one life cycle of that community about 20 years. So I think just my, my wrap up is, we're not great at predicting population, uh, economic or traffic trends 20 years in advance, but that's the useful life of what we're building. And a lot of times it's even longer. I think it's important to remember that we have never relieved traffic by accommodating it. Really, uh, the, the best way I've seen uh, tra to get traffic to go down is to, uh, is to have an underperforming uh, uh, economy, which is certainly not anybody's objective. And the last thing is that it's really important that investments push the result you want rather than just react to current circumstances. Thank you. Um, if I could maybe pull in our um, panelists from the municipalities again, and I'll start with you, Tom, in Gorham. Um, you talked a little bit already about what Gorham's doing to ensure that land use and transit planning is appropriate and sufficient. I want to dig down a little more into that. Um, you're talking about um, travel nodes uh, that might help support transit on the way out to Gorham and maybe beyond. Um, what does that development look like when you're talking about density? What would that look like so that it would really support transit and provide an alternative for, um, for people being dependent on vehicles? Yeah, so uh, under the development transfer program, I, I talked about basically in our old zoning ordinances, I think the, the most dense that we would allow was basically suburban residential in that area. And I think it was one dwelling unit per 40,000 square feet. 
we have now changed that in the growth area to the development transfer program. And I think you can get down somewhere into one unit per 3,000 square feet or 4,000. I have to go back and check, but it's, it's somewhere in that neighbor, three, three to 5,000. So we're allowing a lot more density. Um, we're looking at providing sewer and water in those areas. We're looking at ways to do that. So really getting public infrastructure there and then increasing the density so those, those areas can develop as they need to. Great, thanks. Um, Jay, how about in Scarborough to the same way, but um, what would future development and density look like so that there are really viable options to um, automobile use? Yeah, I, I think, you know, as I, for us here in Scarborough, I think a lot of the densities that would enable or, or provide for um, transit are really being directed more towards the east on the other side of the turnpike. I have talked about the North Scarborough village, but that really is more of a Hamlet style village. It's, it's smaller, so it's not in and of itself going to be what could, um, you know, I don't think that would be the type of density that in and of itself would be a, a catalyst for transit. However, where I see transit could come into play certainly as a, um, if there, um, if it's a robust system, could enable uh, folks a, another option rather than having to drive their own vehicle all the way into, into their population centers, into the, their jobs or, or retail services. Um, so I would see for, for Scarborough, that would probably be more the, the play in transit, um, where I would see, again, for us here in our community, really looking for sort of uh, the densities being uh, elsewhere um, that along the Route 1 corridor and Payne Road corridor, folks are familiar with that along the main mall type area. Great, thanks, Jay. Um, Scott, do we have Scott here? There he is. Um, you talked about the uh, planning for the Standish Village Center. Um, what does that ideally look like um, so that you have the, the density and the development model so that people don't need to get in their cars uh, to take care of basic service or to access. I mean, our, the Standish Corner is a, a mixed use zone. It's intended to have businesses to support local residents. And we have both your relatively, especially for out in the more rural part of this region, fairly small minimum lot sizes and allowances for uh, what we call village housing, which would be significantly more dense developments. And the hope is that we can create something like a more traditional village. And now maybe it's a little bigger than the village that has traditionally been in Standish, but it is not out of step with what people are familiar with in this region. And as a node, both with commercial and residential, it would hope, hopefully, as it's built out, could be a anchor point for a transit line, in my mind, for sure. Great, thanks. Um, maybe we'll Paul and Peter in on this too, and just you are, because you guys have thought a lot about this, even though Peter, maybe you're focused a little more on the road. Um, what does development look like? So it presents a, a viable option for automobile dependency for residents out there. Peter or Paul, are you guys available? Let me just say one thing, and I want to defer to Paul because he's the expert. There's, you couldn't possibly put a transit line on the current road system going out to South Gorham. The, the bus would be stopped at eight o'clock in the morning, right along with everybody else who stopped, and again at 4.30 in the evening. It wouldn't make any sense. If the traffic is relieved, and that is one of the fundamental reasons for this, is to relieve the traffic on some of those, on, on, on all of those roads, frankly, and then you have room to put a transit system either on the existing roads or on the new road, you put an express transit on the new road and maybe it comes in from Standish and goes down the bypass, gets onto the new road and goes all the way into Portland. One of the pending questions is, is this going to flood traffic into Portland? Will the new 
capacity that allows traffic to go into Portland? Is it going to be bad news for Portland? No, that's exactly why we need transit because it, transit preserves the capacity of the, the road and the capacity that already exists in Portland. The, one of the big things that will happen with this road leading into exit 45 is when you exit 45 is now designed and, and will be finished in another few months so that you can make a right turn and go to Boston, you can make a left turn and go to Augusta, or you can keep going straight and get on to 95, 295 rather, and go up the coast of Maine or stop off in Portland. It distributes traffic efficiently uh, and effectively, but clearly the traffic that wants to go into the Maine Medical Center or Portland City Hall should have the transit option, that, but it doesn't have it now. Paul, let me ask you then a little bit, what kind of development do we really need in these Western, or what kind of development models do we need in these Western communities that can support the transit that will create a demand for transit? So I, to answer the question, Marcos, I, I, you know, I think the simple answer is increased density, increased opportunity to put, I'll say a lot of stuff in a, in, a, in, a, in a confined space. I mean, when you can create transit nodes, transit hubs, when you can create compact development, when you can create village centers, these are all the places where, um, you know, transit succeeds. It's not, you know, it's, 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 it's been the magic formula for a long time. I know uh, after the 2012 study, there were a couple of really strong initiatives that I that that I know got specifically to what, what I believe you're asking is what should this look like? Where should this be? I know the 2015 PACS Transit Supportive Development Study looked at some very specific areas and where were they and what that might look like and what were the details of that. Um, you know, Sustain Southern Maine, what great initiative by GP Cog, which really I think kind of came as an offshoot of the 2012 study also look to do the same. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm in an envious position where I can say a lot of what I think, but I know it's really up to the municipalities to decide how they want to develop. But I think we're hearing very unanimously their desire to create these places, to create opportunities for transit. Um, and, you know, and in this case, the opportunity to do that, um, you know, can be um, you know, can be explored by considering a connector and how these things can be, you know, best organized around it. So um, hope I answered your question, Marcos, but I, again, I think there's a lot of good examples of how this could, what this could look like and where, where it could go. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, Christina, I want to pull you back into the conversation a little bit. Maybe you look at this from the regional level. Um, could you help us paint a picture of what our desired outcomes are um, how we're keeping track of them, how we're measuring them, who's accountable if this works, who gets the credit, and if this doesn't work, um, how do we learn from it? And then finally, how does the region shift as, as things change and um, you know, we see unintended consequences or results? I think you're muted, Christina. You'd think by now I would learn. Um, Marco said it's such a huge question. Can you try to break it down for me just a little sure. bit? Like, yeah, maybe first, um, you know, help us paint a picture of what the desired outcome is and how do we know when we get it? How do we measure that? Sure. Uh, I mean, you've heard from the communities, and I know Mayor Mike Foley is on the line here too, that the communities have been working actively towards creating more village style development. Really, that village style development is best served by a transit connection, not a limited access highway. So when we think about the two projects together, the rapid transit one that I mentioned before, as well as the highway, we need to think about how they can support each other. Um, so when I think about outcomes, I'm thinking that you need to have good supportive land use for transit. You need to have high ridership for that transit. And what that will do is allow for more affordability in homes, more affordability for household budgets because people can, can jump on transit. And those that have the choice to be able to ride in their cars and pay the toll, they'll be able to uh, like take some of that congestion off of those local roads, which may help reinforce the village style development that Jay was talking about, the Hamlet style and other things like that. So there are ways that we might be able to design these projects so that they're mutually reinforceable and that we end up with uh, kind of, you know, pearls of these villages 
along the transit line with a direct you know traffic route that would um, that would really feed more people between Gorham and that exit 45. So you know from our perspective and, and just to scope back a little bit, some of the outcomes that we really want to see in the region are more equity amongst different groups of people and particularly that we're lifting up those that have lower incomes and are, have disabilities and things like that. And transit is very well suited for that. And then we also have some very significant climate goals that we need to meet in the region. So as we're designing our transportation system and we're working on figuring out how to put homes and jobs close together and connect them with transit, we need to do it in a way that meets the ambitious goals of the Maine Won't Wait climate plan. Does that answer your question? Because I feel like yours was a little bit, maybe well, I went too far there. Yeah. You answered the first part. Let me give you the, the second part then. Sure. Um, and that is, you know, I guess a part of a question of accountability. Um, we're keeping track of this, um, especially when there's a number of different partners at play here. And then how do we adjust as we see things change on the ground? I mean, this is really a yeah. long-term project. How do we, how does the region shift um, as, as demand shifts and as um, development and traffic patterns shift? Yeah, this is actually squarely in the bailiwick of GB Cog in that we collect data. And, you know, in order for us to have accountability, we need to have the data to look at. So when I think about um, housing, for example, we've been talking about the study in, in um, uh, the PAC study in 2015 that laid out several different village style developments. We need to have a clear understanding as a region how much progress we're making on those things. And uh, GB Cog will be releasing a report next week that talks about how we're doing on housing as a region. And um, many of the communities here, uh, Gorham, Westbrook, South Portland, Scarborough, have all been part of that study. And we've looked at some of the barriers to developing multifamily housing and, um, and to start to track our progress over time. The communities represented here and others have committed to expanding housing choices by 10%. So we need to look at whether we're doing that, are we doing it in an affordable way, and where is that housing actually being built? Is it being built in village style or is it being built sprawl wise? So that's one piece of accountability and GVCOG can help with that. The second piece of accountability is around counting transportation data. So if we have rapid transit, what's the ridership on it? Is it going up or down? What happens when we have uh, you know, a collapsing economy like Beth said or another pandemic or something else and how do we recover from it and holding ourselves accountable with that data. We have some of that in the region but we don't have enough data on public transportation ridership. Um, and then how does that compare with reducing vehicle miles traveled? We have not as a region set a baseline for that or set a goal yet in order to reach that 10% reduction that's called for in the Maine Won't Wait plan. And in fact, our region is the densest region in the whole state. We're probably gonna to need to overperform on that 10% uh, goal. So how do we as a region come together, set that goal and then hold ourselves accountable for reducing the amount of that people are driving so that we can reduce transportation emissions. And as we know in Maine, transportation makes up 54% of the emissions for greenhouse gases. So it is imperative that we get control of those emissions. How is that, Marcos? Is oh, that that That's good, yeah, yeah. thanks a lot. Um, Beth, I wanna circle back to you. Um, now we've heard a little bit more of the uh, thinking here. This is the roadway itself is $200 million plus project. And it sounds like there's a lot of other moving pieces involved. Um, what are some viable alternatives to this plan? Yeah, I mean, and a lot of people mentioned uh, other things to be considered and, and some really creative thinking for the region. I think folks are, are raising a lot of the right questions. Um, it, so, you know, those who are concerned about local streets being used as throughways, well, they can be made less attractive as throughways by narrowing them and slowing them down and making them much more locally serving. Um, it's not fun to have to go 20 to 25 miles per hour all the way you know, over a long trip. So uh, one of the big problems we have in this country is we don't decide what we want our roads to be. We try to make them half a locally serving road and half a regional ser serving road, which creates a lot of safety problems 
And it also creates a, a kind of a, a futon of transportation, something that's neither a good bed nor a good couch, but it's kind of both at the same time. And it just doesn't function very well. So take these things that are acting as roads and turn them into streets, make them much uh, slower and more narrow, and then people won't want to choose them to go through. You can also you know, really talk about investing strongly in transit in the region. And that means giving transit its own space, which also means taking away space from vehicles. I mean, transit cannot be an add-on. If you want it to be attractive, you're right. You don't want it to sit in traffic. But if you just throw it in with temporarily alleviated traffic, you haven't created good transit either. Further, you might want that transit to stay on the local roads and not be on a highway. It might operate better being something that's, that serves. You want transit to be close to development, close to where people are going to. Um, you might want to really focus on the land use and getting the things people are traveling to closer to them or encourage telecommuting so that you don't see uh, you know, people traveling uh, you know, in those traditionally uh, uh, traffic times or, or encourage, uh, especially now with, with COVID, I think people are much more open to staggered work start and, and stop times so that you're expanding that, that you know, rush hour travel and spreading it out over a long time, more de demand management. Um, and, and to a great extent, you do want to use that traffic to discourage more of that long haul commuting. If someone wants to move far away from where they work, they should no more desire the taxpayer to pay to speed their travel than I, who moved close to work, should expect the taxpayer to expand my home. I made my choice. I wanted to be close to work. I was not willing to put this time into travel. And I recognized I had to take less living space as a result. I think we need to stop moving so heavily towards this notion uh, that there are no trade-offs. Um, and in terms of messaging, I think we need to be very clear from a transportation perspective. When areas choose to allow housing far away from work centers and, and uh, shopping areas and retail centers, when they build predominantly housing or uh, predominantly uh, single family housing, uh, they are choosing, they are designing for congestion and for higher cost, not just to the taxpayer who has fewer people to cover the, the cost of, um, of infrastructure and services, but higher costs to the households where their transportation costs are often eating up any household uh, uh, savings, especially when we see gas prices go up and things like that. So rather than pretend that's not the case, which unfortunately a lot of us from the transportation sphere have done, we, we need to say, oh, well, congratulations on your new development. There's gonna be a heavy amount of congestion from that. Good luck. Um, and not bail people out of it. We have been bailing communities out of this for decades. And we recently did a study of what adding uh, capacity has done and what it has done is exploded congestion. We have seen in the largest 100 uh, uh, metro areas in the country, um, growth by and population of, in the 30 percentile area, uh, growth in lane miles in the 40 percentile, so we're building more uh, roads than we are having population growth, and an explosion of congestion. We've seen a 140% increase in congestion. So this is not going to work. It never does. And, uh, and what we can do is really start moving towards measuring what matters. Let's measure multimodal access. How easy is it, especially for with those equity concerns, for people with access to no car or few cars to get to work, to get to school, to get to medical care, to get to retail centers? The state of Virginia has been using this as a way to measure uh, which projects they wanna invest in for seven years now. And all they're using is GIS. It's not even a new technology, it's actually pretty old. Uh, GIS, if you look at when GIS was being deployed for policymaking in the 90s, the kids that were born then are now our colleagues. This is, uh, this is old technology. If we just bring it over to transportation, we can learn a lot about 
how land use and transportation investments will impact or undermine our objectives. We can measure housing plus transportation costs and figure out what we're doing to our constituents. And we can also really start to calculate public cost versus public tax receipts. So as we continue to develop in this very spread out way, in this very housing centric way, um, what is the long-term cost to those taxpayers of that development? Uh, my colleagues do this and regularly show that uh, it's really untenable and it tends to result in, um, in, in either big boosts in taxes or uh, kind of the disintegration of that community. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to really use this as an excuse to change what we measure, change how we talk about things, and look at some really interesting alternatives. Thank you, Beth. Um, we're going to move our conversation into um, discussing what's next, um, what next steps are, and what we should be looking for in the future. And um, Christine, I have another question for you, um, sort of building upon some of Beth's points about um, transit, um, what does sufficient transit look like in this region and how do we best achieve it? Sure, thanks Marcos. Um, our region, when we look at our region compared to other regions, we don't have as transit rich a region as we could. We're underperforming our other regions. And so part of what we're trying to do at GB COG is, is create stronger transit. What that means is faster, more frequent, and longer hours. And that we know from many surveys where we've surveyed both people that ride transit right now and those that want to ride, that that's what they need. So we are looking specifically at this corridor. It's the first of five corridors that were recommended in a plan that we just completed a year ago, a fresh plan to introduce rapid transit to the region. And uh, this one is the shortest one with the most density. So we wanted to try this one first. And the corridor is different than where the spur is. Um, and we're just at the beginning of the study. So it's kind of out of sync with where the metric, where, where the turnpike is with its study. But really these two projects sh should be looked at together because it's the same general geography, even though it's different corridors. But we feel that if we can um, add either bus rapid transit or rail rapid transit, we'd be providing um, a, a direct route. So, you know, Beth is right, it, the bus can't be caught in congestion. Rail is not caught in congestion unless they're freight trains, but can't be caught in congestion. And we think around, um, you know, as we're going out Brighton Avenue, there's opportunity to hit the main congestion points with some targeted treatment to allow the buses to go faster, priority signals, things like that. Once you start creating that priority for buses, those that are sitting in traffic want to get on the bus. But the way for transit really to work is it's got to be competitive with the automobile. Transit is way cheaper than owning an automobile. So you got that covered, but you got to get to the time and the convenience factor. And so that's what we need in this region. We need a different kind of public transportation than we have right now. And it's got to be fast and cheap and plentiful. And so we think we've got the start of that with this new project that um, that's being considered right now. Thank you. Um, question, next question for our partners at the municipalities. Um, maybe I'll start with you again, Tom. Um, what, what are next steps in Gorham for dealing with congestion and traffic growth in the region? Tom, are you there? Jay, you came on. Do you want to take that first for Scarborough? Uh, sure. And, and I alluded to it a little bit before. We are really starting um, to study how transit can play a role in our future growth. We're, we've um, been a bit of a hole in the donut of transit in the region for, for a long time, right? There's the South Portland, Portland, um, services, Saco, Old, uh, Biddeford, they have their services and really we're serviced by an intermittent line that comes through, but folks aren't really sure quite how to participate. So as we're starting to see the, the development and the articulation of our vision for, for our community, the, the denser growth in the growth areas that I talked about before along the Route 1 and Payne Road corridor, I think that's we're really starting, so I think for us, it's really about seeing 
studying, understanding ridership, understanding the um, what it's going to, um, what the feasibility for transit will be as we start to see the densities start to occur in our community. Because as I mentioned before, for you know the last forty or fifty years leading up to fairly recently, you know Scarborough did a heck of a job of single family cul-de-sac homes, and that's not the type of development that really uh, enables for transit, but um, I think we're starting to see the beginnings of it. And, um, and so that might give us some opportunity to start to participate and become uh, uh, a partner in, in that. Thank you, Jim. Sorry about that. I got my phone was ringing and I missed the question. So what was the question? No problem. Yeah. Um, Paul, or I'm sorry, Tom, what's, um, what are the next steps in Gorm for dealing with traffic congestion and traffic growth? Uh, on a land use portion, I, I think uh, Peter Mill started to talk about it. We're looking to rezone portions of South Gorm that have been identified as growth areas. So kind of getting that density in there to kind of develop nodes. Uh, we have adopted a couple other mixed use districts along 25 that would also support nodes in the existing uh, Husky line. So if, if that service ever expands, those densities would equate to hopefully having a transit stop. Uh, and then just further building on that, developing the development transfer overlay provisions and then buying up those areas in Gorm that we wanna protect from development. So really a two prong approach, basically targeting growth and then protecting that land we don't want the growth in. So we don't get those traffic yeah. issues later on down the road. So that, that's what we're working on currently. Okay, thank you. Um, and Scott, what do you see as next steps in Standish for um, dealing with traffic congestion and traffic growth? And then Marcos, after that, perhaps we can go to Mayor Foley for Westbrook's perspective. Oh, sure, great. Um, yeah, just uh, quick, we have a couple problem intersections, as I mentioned before, that need to be addressed under current situations, but going forward, it's as uh, the other town municipalities mentioned, it's trying to channel the growth into to growth areas that can support better design and better transit as we move forward. Uh, the growth is coming whether we want it or not. So it's trying to make sure that it is done in a way that we can then manage and, and doesn't make these things worse. Thank you. Mayor Foley, thank you for joining us. Um, maybe you can give us uh, the perspective from Westbrook on these issues. Thank you uh, so much. And I think what I can say is kind of relevant to the um, uh, question that you just asked, but I'll, I apologize if I recap a little bit of the past. But uh, Mayor Michael Foley of the city of Westbrook, just quick perspective, I've been serving my community nearly two decades. And I, during that time, I've also served on the Greater Portland Transit District Board of Directors, as we know as Metro. So been 110% uh, supportive of our community and public transit in the region. In fact, um, I've been part of the board and a significant advocate for the largest transit expansion in the history of the greater Portland region when we expanded to offer the Husky line and the route three of service uh, through the city of Westbrook into South Portland, which was again, the largest transit expansion that helped to refine the Metro route significantly to do a lot of the things that Christina was talking about to try and make it more convenient and to try and make it more effective for people. The question that you just asked about traffic congestion Westbrook is probably, of all the communities participating in this program, the one poised to benefit significantly from traffic congestion relief of all of these communities. Westbrook is the pass-through community for the greater Portland region. You cannot get into any of these other communities that we've talked about without passing through Westbrook. And we have tremendous amount of congestion on some of our major roads. In fact, we have an arterial that connects from Portland, goes down in kind of a boulevard road with four lane roadway, um, which we call William Clark Drive, that goes all the way to Gorham, which is um, part of the route that the Husky line travels on. And if we were able to, and at the same time, Westbrook is doing tremendous amount of housing development to help support the, the housing crisis in the region. And, and at the same time, we're creating more traffic for ourselves when all of our other neighboring communities are creating a significant amount of traffic, which is traveling through our community. This turnpike connector would have a tremendous benefit to the city of Westbrook. And if we can relieve some of the congestion in Westbrook, we can do all of the things that Beth suggested as transit investment 
And that boulevard that I talked about, we could take away lanes of traffic. We could have a bus only lane. We could do all those things to make the Husky line more convenient. We, if we could invest in bus rapid transit, um, a BRT line that Christina talked about that could travel through the city of Westbrook on some of these roads that we could give some transit exclusivity that could travel to Gorm, travel to Standish, travel to Wyndham, travel to all these Westbrook communities that could help with transit expansion without the need to invest in something like rail, which would be a completely different trajectory. But in order to do this, in order to have the robust transit system, I think that Beth talks about, and I would love to have in our region, we would need a million people to move into our region and, and a, a huge chunk of those to use transit. So I really, really hope that people can see the benefit of this road coupled with transit potentially overlaying on the road, we can make significant transit improvements in our region in all the other areas uh, that I suggested. So I look forward to participating more in these discussions in the future. And I apologize, I wasn't uh, originally as a panelist, but thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mayor. And I'm sorry we weren't able to pull you in earlier into the conversation too. Um, Beth, maybe a, a final question for you before we turn to questions from the audience. Um, what questions should the community be asking as this project picks up steam? You're, you're muted. Though. I did it too. It's, we're all guilty, we'll never learn. Um, yeah, I think that there's a bunch of, of questions to ask. Um, I think in transportation, like I mentioned before, how do we delineate between local routes and throughways? Really, we should design those roadways to look totally different uh, and, and be something that people catch like that the in-betweens are non-desirable. Uh, what does it mean for transit to be competitive? Uh, a lot of times people focus on uh, the time of travel. It's really about frequency, reliability, uh, convenience, comfort, expense, and the ability to multitask. Um, I take transit to work. It takes longer than driving, but I conduct a lot of work. Uh, so it's worth it to me because I come out ahead spending five or 10 minutes more on transit but uh, we're, we rather foolishly overestimate the, the time value. Um, in addressing land use, you know, we need to think about more than just uh, the type of housing we allow. It's how housing types and densities, it's parking minimums, mixing uses, allow greater heights, uh, removing setbacks, allowing ADUs. Um, it's a lot that goes together. When we only pick it one, we're not truly deregulating a system built up to deal with uh, problems of early industrialization over 100 years ago. Uh, and when you don't get as much change as you might think. Uh, when Minneapolis got, uh, got rid of only single family zoning, um, it, it, over three years, the, the whole metro area saw three requests for uh, going to higher densities on particular properties. It's about more than that one thing. It really takes a whole uh, effort. And the last thing I will say is just recognize that uh, it is natural for people to fear change and figure out a way to make sure a handful of people that are naturally afraid of change aren't able to uh, cause a problem at every site of every potential development. Um, the, the fact of the matter is your region has changed. It is changing right now. And there's nothing you can do to stop that change. And so uh, rather than uh, indulge people's belief that it can be uh, preserved in amber, I think we need to figure out ways to make sure that the region as a whole can push that change in a direction they like and not allow a handful of folks uh, stop it. Thank you, Beth. Um, I think at this point, we're gonna turn it back over to Maggie and Nancy um, for some questions from the audience. Great, thank you so much, Marco Sim, and thanks to all of our panelists um, for all of your great commentary so far. Um, so I think I wanna start with a question. Um, when thinking about the three legs of the stool from the study, um, the spur, transit, and land use, um, is order important in terms of how those um, that work is done? And does it matter if transit or updated land use regulations are in place before a spur? Um, and then if so, how does the region coordinate decisions around these these different um, legs of the stool with different authorities and funding sources. Um, I don't know if who would like to take that question first. Um, I'll open it up to all of our panelists and feel free to turn your cameras, cameras back on. I see Paul has his hand up and I'll follow Paul. Great. Oh, uh, 
So a great question. Uh, again, I, I think one of the things we, we learned very well in the 2012 study was that, again, I know we've said it a lot, doing all of these three things in parallel is important. One of the great messages that I've heard the authority talk about as they've contemplated whether a new road um, you know, could happen um, is that if it is going to happen, this is the exact window to figure out what's the best things that can be done, land use, transit, housing, that again, if a new road is built, how does it maximize the opportunity at hand? So again, I, I, I don't know if it's answering the question directly in terms of order, but um, if you are gonna have this uh, type of investment coming, uh, transportation investment coming, what a perfect window to figure out, you know, A, what's gonna be the magnitude of what you're facing? What are the opportunities with municipal, uh, you know, zoning and comp plans and land use that can be changed? Uh, you know, as, 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 as um, um, you know, as has been said by Christina, again, how might this dovetail with the, with the transit study that's going on? So again, to me, this is the perfect window to evaluate all of that and figure out sort of what's the best uh, collection of all of these things to, to figure out the challenge at hand. And I'll go to Christina and then we'll go to Beth. So I, I would just add to that that the land use piece is absolutely critical to get right. And if I wanted to say how the sequence was, I'd say land use first. Of course, nothing's ever that clean. But the municipalities here, our member municipalities, have been making some progress in doing village style development. I think all of them would agree more needs to be done. And you heard that from them today. So that would be the place where I think there needs to be the most focus. And transit can follow much more easily if you have the density of those village nodes. The other thing about transit is once you move from regular bus transit that's slower than traffic to bus transit or rail transit that is on kind of a fixed route and can be as competitive with a car, then you start to see investment around those transit or train stops. And that can have a mutually reinforcing impact where you have the village that begins, you bring the transit in, it catalyzes more investment, the village gets better, the, the ridership gets better, better. And so in that context, there, there isn't really like a chicken egg, except that you need to at least have the bones of a good village. And we're lucky in New England, we have a lot of really great bones and a lot of our good villages. Um, but over time, we have dispersed into kind of suburban sprawl, very difficult to reverse and very difficult thinking about what Beth was saying about the number of people that are afraid of change and afraid of density. Um, it has to be really well designed in order for the community to support it. So I would just add those two things that they really, that the land use is absolutely critical and there is no land use authority except for at the local municipal level. So our table where we are at, at, as a regional planning agency is a place where the communities come together, can really look at what one another is doing, share best practices, and start to see how the housing is developing and also the employment um, on a map and see how they can coordinate together in order to create more of that, I call it like a pearl necklace of villages. Thanks, Christina. Beth? Yeah, uh, I want to second what Christina said. Uh, our land use situation, our land use approach was created uh, starting at, by an effort in 1921 by Herbert Hoover when he ran the Department of Commerce in response to early industrialization, overcrowded uh, cities and towns before we had water and sewage. Uh, they pushed, the federal government and states pushed out this approach on the locals very hard. Um, the federal government and the states need to have a role in taking it down because we now need to address the problems of 2021 and 22, not 1921 and 22. And what we are discussing is a land use problem. Transportation is a means, not an end. Land use is the end. Solving land use problems with transportation is like solving a virulent virus causing a high fever with Tylenol. You got to fight the virus, not the fever. Thanks, Beth. Um, and I see Tom has his hand up too. Yeah, thank you. So I'll just, I mean, I think land use is definitely important and I think transit is definitely important. But what, as you get your land use right, then you get to, as developments come in, you get to come through site plan and subdivision review. There are performance standards there that say level of service in the roads got to be adequate. So then if you dump all kinds of traffic on a road that's already failing, 
the projects will not get through the planning broad process. So it can't be one, it, it can't be just land use because we won't be able to get the density we want because the roads are already failing level of service. So how do we add those units there when the planning boards will have, have issues trying to approve them? So it's really all moving forward together and having the right partners to do that. And I think that's the most important part. Tom is right. L level of service should come out of all land use codes. Thank you. Um, so next question, um, and maybe this can go to Paul and Peter first. Why have Maine's largest transportation project evaluated and built by an agency that is not participating in the DOT long range process and by its own admission has no authority to manage transit or active transportation? If the answer is funding through tolls, does that send the wrong incentive? How many of the vehicles must use the expansion to pay for construction and maintenance? Would the MTA be open to a legislative change that would allow transfer of toll revenue to support transit? I know that's a lot of questions. Court, I'll let you. No, look, that's, that's your bailiff, not yours. We don't, <laughs> we don't need to be told by the legislature to support transit. We've done it, my own board, I work for a seven member board. And uh, we have supported transit very tangibly in years past. And I've, I'm in constant contact with the people who manage transit agencies in Greater Port. I've offered, I've offered, I can't tell you how many times I've told Greg Jordan, tell me when you want one of those little things in your buses that turns the light green just for buses. I'll be glad to buy some for you. I mean, we, we've been actively supporting things that maintain capacity that we create. Um, a, we're very cooperative with the other agencies and will continue to be. DOT has endorsed this vigorously. We have the director of DOT sits on my board. He's one of the seven members of my board. So to, to accuse us of not coordinating with DOT is crazy. We work with DOT all the time. We're directed by, by our enabling act to coordinate with DOT. This project has their endorsement it has their support. They've said, you're the agency that can solve this issue. Go about it and do it. And we've spent, we've spent already quite a few millions of dollars studying it carefully and trying to design a solution that people would find acceptable. And that's why we are ready at this juncture to go out and start engaging in a more public open process to say, okay, here is a proposed alignment. What do you think about it? Let's talk about it. And let's talk about the consequences. Thanks, Peter. Does anybody else want to chime in on that? I can't remember what's else. I can't remember the whole question. Um, well, we're running out of time, so I think we'll do one last question. Um, so um, we got a couple sort of about incentivizing people to use alternative means of transportation and then um, how the spur plays in with the climate action plan. Um, I don't know who would like to answer that, maybe Christina or Beth, or any of our municipal representatives as well. So I, I don't think we know how the spur supports or may not support the climate action plan. Uh, we know that the climate action plan is calling for a reduction in vehicle miles traveled. We also know that when you get people out of congestion, and move them faster, it can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So I think there's a, there's a need to understand how those two things interact. We also know that the electric um, vehicle fleet is changing over, but there's a recognition within the main climate action plan that you cannot solve the transportation emissions issue just with electric vehicles. And that's why there's a commitment to also trying to support public transportation, walking and biking. And I just want to put a little plug in for active transportation because we haven't talked about it um, in this panel so far. But one of the key components of when you're building that pearl of village, pearl style villages and also connecting it by transit is to make sure that the roads and Beth alluded to this, that you know, roads that are supposed to be in villages should be slower so that everybody's safer, but also should have intentional focus on keeping people that are walking or biking or rolling or strolling, all of those people as safe as possible. And so there is an opportunity as we think about the future of this larger corridor that we make sure that we're connecting those village nodes with walking and biking and starting to think about transit, walking, biking, main streets, village style development all together. 
Um, so I will say that, uh, you know, if the effort is to lower VMT, we, we have no evidence that building more roads can contribute to that or lower emissions. Um, I invite folks to look at the shift calculator that we worked on based on the great work that Caltrans got work going uh, to address their VMT goals. Um, it looks at uh, induced demand. It allows you to calculate it they did it for California and we just repeated their work to, uh, to work across the country. If you're interested in better information and maybe a little chuckle on information, um, I, I shared a little blurb from an Australian television show that explains how uh, induced demand comes uh, uh, about and it, it's hilarious, but it also shows that VMT is not going down by making more space. If you wanna look at how to shift people's behavior, uh, people's behavior follow the built environment almost perfectly. Uh, I have a podcast addiction and one of my favorites is 99% Invisible, which is a whole podcast that talks about how people uh, react to design to the point where what you wear can change your test scores. Um, and we find that people's behavior follows the built environment as well. Uh, if you take the same people and move them to different communities, they travel differently naturally. They drive differently naturally. When I lived in Baton Rouge and I needed a car to get to a job, but I couldn't afford a car because I couldn't find a job, uh, I could lean back on my parents uh, to buy me that car. But that car was the most important thing in the world because without it, I did not eat. When I moved to Washington, D.C., the first thing I did was get rid of it. I did not change the built environment changed. So when you provide the service, when you build the land use to make moving around on your own two feet possible and not scary and transit frequent, more important than anything else, frequent, people change. Maggie just adds a, a closing comment here. Uh, you know, I spent a pretty significant part of my career trying to better connect transportation and land use. It's been a, it's been a, a challenge that we've all faced and we, and, and, and we all recognize, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly mindful as, as is Peter of, 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 his, of his sisters, the governor's uh, initiatives. We are very uh, convinced in our analysis, which we'll be happy to share. It has shown that there is an opportunity here to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Completely agree that that is an opportunity we should be uh, we should be taking. And again, I think the great conversation that has already started today is, again, if this road comes and we connect it to multi-use paths, transit, you know, um, multifamily housing, the ability to reclaim back some parts of municipalities that can be more villages and walkable, bikeable, and safe. Um, is that the better collective answer? And again, I, I think as, as we're going to find out as we engage in the public process on uh, the Gorham Connector, um, again, if we put all of these parts and pieces together, um, can we achieve a, a, a better result than just looking at these things individually? So again, very, very excited to, for the opportunity to do that in the very near future. Thanks, Paul. Um, and I wanna thank all of our panelists and Mayor Foley. I also wanna thank our um, great GoSmart staff, Nancy and Sherry, um, for putting on such a great webinar today. Um, and I do wanna remind everyone that we did record this webinar and we'll be posting it to GrowSmart's um, social media and YouTube platforms. Um, and um, we'd be happy to have another webinar in the future um, to follow up on this once um, things are moving forward more and we know more information. Um, but thanks again to everybody who joined today. Um, and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you for Thank you. joining us.